So I think that God has set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. But we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. You are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and are naked, and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place. And labor working with our hands, being reviled, we blessed, being persecuted, we suffer it. I'd like to read another verse. In the first epistle of Peter, first chapter, twelfth verse, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us that did minister the things which are now reported unto you, by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desired to look into. I'd like to call your attention to the ninth verse, uh, for I think that God has set forth us apostles last, as it were, appointed to death, and we are made a spectacle unto the world, unto angels, and to men. I'm going to ask Brother Urshan if he would pray God would help us tonight in this message. I thought he was standing right here. Brother Ursa, uh, Brother Perry, would you ask God to bless? Excited, uh, they bring the gladiators out then only with 
bare hands and perhaps a, just a knife or a very small weapon, and the beast then would be turned loose on the gladiator in this predicament, and then the crowd would perhaps see this man slain. And Paul seems to refer or, or indicate that God seemed like had brought us apostles, he said, out last at the last of the event, and we've been stripped of many things that you've been blessed with. And uh, we're, we're on display before the crowd, and uh, they're watching to see who's going to win the battle. Will the apostle survive this, or will Satan win a victory? He said to how that we've been uh, despised, we've been both hungry and thirsty, naked, buffeted, no certain dwelling place, labor working with our hands, when we're reviled, we bless, and when we're being persecuted, we suffer it, being defamed, we entreat, and we're like the filth of the earth and the off and so on. He said that it seems like that we were brought in at the last event. But this is no sad story to the apostle. In fact, the very beginning of his ministry or his conversion, the Lord said, I will show you what great things you must suffer for my name's sake. Paul isn't complaining about this, but I do feel like that he is chiding this church that they are standing on the sidelines as spectators when they ought to be in the arena with them. There's a lot of difference on which side of this event you're in. If you're in the arena and the gazing crowd is watching you, it's a lot of difference than just be on the sidelines and passing your comments. Yeah. The Apostle Paul was mentioning how that uh, we're weak but you're strong, and uh, we're suffering and you're being blessed, and uh, while we're on display and uh, you are taking a seat, and notice the spectators are this class. These are the only spectators that watch this event. The world, angels, men. And I can't help but believe this represents the spirit world, Satan, angels, and the men of this world. And we have no place sitting with that crowd. We're not in the angelic crowd. We're not in the Satan group. Nor are we in the seat of the scornful. We are on stage. We are the actors. We are the ones that are being looked upon. And we must get involved. We will never be pleasing to God to take a seat in the comfortable seat of a spectator and criticize the church for its lack and its shortcomings and, and picture, uh, point out its failures. I am aware that this speaks of a theater. And I feel like it does a very good job of portraying it in that light. I think this great event began way back in the eon of ages in the mind of God. God had already planned to set the stage for all of these events. This earth, this universe, uh, this earth is the, uh, I believe, the stage for the universe. I believe it's the theater for the universe. I believe this is where God's doing things that he perhaps is not doing anywhere else. And I can see that when angels rallied around him, when he performed the great acts of creation, they saw his mighty works, they saw his great display. And uh, here is Lucifer with his great high honor a place in, in the kingdom of angels. And uh, they saw the day when there uh, come a split in heaven. Third of the angels were influenced by this evil, diabolical um, uh, angel in heaven. And these angels of glory, that other host, when they saw how God, without mercy, cut these angels off and cast them out, there was no remedy, there was no salvation, it was no mercy. They were cut off and cast out. And the angels of heaven sang the song, Holy, Holy, Holy was God for his actions. The remaining angels recognized that Almighty God in his wise providence had made a wise decision to cast this group to the lake of fire 
and completely out of his presence. But then the day came when God made man, put him on the earth, and gave him dominion over all of this world, and made him uh, sit in a very distinguished place. And uh, then when Satan made his bid and won his victory and caused our, poor, our parents to fall into sin, and it was at this moment, I believe, the angels were looking on. I believe they were wondering, what will he do about this? For he had never tolerated disobedience. Not one angel could ever sass back. Not one angel could speak a word of disrespect. Not one angel and survive. There's salva no salvation for him. He's off. He's gone. He's forever cut off. But here's mortal man made of the dust of the earth. Made in the... Uh, of the most lowly material. But there they see the almighty God. They watch him and look on, thinking that perhaps he might go down and cast them where the fallen angels had gone before. But instead of this, there he sees, there they see him catch a little lamb, or animal of some kind, slay it, take off the skin, put it around these sinful folks, leave them with a promise, and leave them with a hope. And the first time I believe the angels ever saw mercy, they saw it in the Garden of Eden. The first time they ever saw divine mercy that overruled divine justice was in the Garden of Eden. And they looked on amazement. They no doubt wondered why. But I doubt if the one would question the Almighty. They had said there was some things done the angels desired to look into, but it was none of their business. They're onlookers. They look on. They, they look at a distance. They look from a, a, a place that they can't quite understand some of these things. I don't think angels can perhaps comprehend the depth of salvation like we do. Oh, thank God. I appreciate the fact I'm in the act. I'm on the stage. I'm not the spectator. I'm the one getting the benefits of all of these things he's performed. And I look and see in the... When they saw him walk away, and there was no casting out, only the Garden of Eden. They watched the handiwork of God all the way through. Satan looks on like angels look on. I believe angels watch us. The Bible said that was one reason why the women should have long hair, because of the angels. I believe that long hair tells an angel that that woman is subjected to her husband. I believe that's one good reason why God wanted to have long hair. Let it be long to show that you're under subjection. Angels look on. Right. I believe every rebellious wife that will not let her hair grow long is a reproach to angels. They look on and wonder, how can that be? How could that be? Because God honors and uh, God honors subjection. And uh, I believe the angels look on. He said you should do it because of the angels. I don't know whether we could offend them or how it affects them. I don't know what it means to them, but surely they're looking on, they're watching us, and they see us. I believe that when God displayed his love throughout the Bible and made the plan of salvation, and they saw Calvary, they saw the, the day of Pentecost, they saw the great and mighty works of God upon the church, and all of these things, I believe the angels of heaven rejoiced in everything that God approved. But finally one day, there come an hour when this great work of God climax to a certain point at least, and that was when God put his spirit in the church. This made angels be able to have a more definite part, I believe, because I think angels are able to enjoy our worship when we can worship in spirit and in truth, because they're worshiping in heaven continually. Hallelujah. And I think ever so often we hit the same key therein, and the heavens ring from glory, and the earth sings from earth, and I believe heaven above can only get these two together. We can't get them together yet because of this mortal. But bless your heart, one of these days we're going to sing together. Hallelujah. I believe the devils look at us. I believe Satan looks at this church. He's looking at us tonight. He's watching. Spectators from the audience, when a play is going on, they will heckle the actors. They'll throw tomatoes and rotten eggs and, and uh, a number of things that don't like something. And they haven't particularly cared for what they've seen sometimes. But I believe the devil has got his eye on every one of us. He's got his eye on God's church, upon God's people. The time when Satan appeared in, somewhere in 
the out yonder someplace, and God spoke to him and said, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Did you let me look him over? And that conversation was taking place somewhere out there. And uh, Satan said, I sure have. I definitely have looked him over. But it uh, didn't do me much good. You've got a hedge around you. Now, the devil knows when God's got a hedge. I believe that devil had walked about that hedge for many a day looking over the fence. Sometimes we don't win spiritual battles, we win carnal battles. We win arguments. We win points. But oh dear God, we want the Lord to win the applause. We want Him to get the credit. It's God Almighty's battle. It is not mine. Bless your heart. He is the director of this play. We're not. We're only the actors. He didn't even ask you what part you wanted to play in the play. He said, here's your part. situation. Devils of hell are looking on what we're doing here. It's his delight if it can stir brother against brother, sister against sister, divide the body of Christ. That's his delight and joy. Bless your heart. When we can learn how to suffer wrong and go on keeping the victory, that keeps that fellow in fits. He's running back every once in a while and calling special conference, special meeting. How do you get a hold of that fellow that's in that condition? How do you get that fellow? I know how to get some folks, but I can't get that fellow. Job, 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 Job. That was a thorn in his flesh. He no doubt had many, he had many uh, bars on his shoulders for certain ones that he'd made fall. He could go about boasting in, in his headquarters. Uh, this one pal, that one pal, that one pal, that one pal. But I can hear one of his lieutenants says, The captain, what about Job? And I can hear him say, Don't mention the name. Considered my servant Job. Considered it. It's your heart. We've been making strategies for him for months and years. And not one's worked. You know why? Because that man found a secret. That no matter what would come or go, he wouldn't de defile himself by charging God foolishly or making foolish statements. Amen. Hallelujah. Brother, when the Holy Ghost can control your tongue, you've got the victory of the devil. I can see that when... When Satan looks on, he looks on to find fault, criticize. And while you're on stage and you're going through what the Lord said for you to do, the Lord's already given you lines to say, given you the prompting of how you should act under pressure, how you should conduct yourself out in front of the crowd, how to be able to behave yourself when Satan's tempting you, how to get along, and all of these things. You've been well instructed. 
and sit within few distance. If you happen to miss the line, if you'll stop and listen carefully, you'll hear him speak the word for you to say in your great old word. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I lost my lines. I don't want to say next. Then just listen for just a few moments and he'll tell you. The next. The I'm not again. Take wrong. Yeah. And then when you go back up on the stage, you've got the word. He's already told you how to ask. And I'll tell you about the apostle Paul. When you step out in front of the spectators, you have them all bewildered, wondering how it is one man can cause heaven's beings, devils reaching the law, and even men of the earth gather around to see one man on display. But oh, the Lord just loves to show his church off. <laughs> Praise the Lord! That gives the light to show his church off. Why is he bragging on Job? He said, if he considered him a servant Job, I want to brag on him for a while. Well, I considered him. But I, you can't do, I can't do a thing with him until you pull the hedge down. And he said, I'll pull the hedge down. Oh, well, I'll be glad to take on the proposition if I can just have that privilege. Brother, the devil has asked for permission perhaps to come in on your life and maybe we're not able to take that kind of a test. And the Lord wouldn't even proposition us before Satan. And yet there's some folks when something bad happens, they say, well, God, why did this happen to little me? I want you to know that this church is supposed to be a glorious church, a strong church, a powerful church, not a car baby church, not a baby church, but a church on stage in front of devils, angels, and the men of this world. And you don't get stage fright while you're out there. Praise the Lord. I believe that when God has made known his will, it isn't up to us to question the outcome. Job was prompted several times what to say. His wife said, Curse God and die! You're not the director. You are the producer. <laughs> no. Actually, you're in the crowd looking on. You're a spectator. That's right. You sound like the crowd to me. Right. The crowd says that. It sounds like you're coming from the section where the devil used to sit in the congregation and the reserve seat. That's right. Sounds like the same voices I hear from the crowd out there. I thought you were with me. You know, sometimes in our sympathy, we defeat the purpose of God. That's right. Come a time when the Lord said to the apostles, He said, I must go and suffer, gonna die, and give it the whole story. Peter with his sympathetic feelings said, Oh no, sir, Lord, no, never, never, never. He pushed that disciple aside and said, Get behind me, Satan. Yeah. Brother, he could detect where the audiences were. Yeah. He could detect from what section of the gallery the tomatoes were coming from. Yeah. He knew from what seat the heckling was coming from. He said, Get behind me, Satan. Yeah. You don't understand the things of God. Brother, I tell you, when we can learn how to suffer, as a Christian suffers, we're learning the things of God. We are so much today to speak and we hear it all around us. My life, my life, my life. Everybody's walking with a sign protesting, my life, my life, my life. <laughs> Everybody has right, right, right. Only one class of people that don't have rights, and that's the church. You know what we did when we signed a little slip at the altar of repentance and baptism getting filled with the Holy Ghost? We said, Lord, all of my rights I give to you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Better than we've been, when God can display his church like he wants to display his church, he'll prove himself to the world and spectators, the devils, the angels, the men of this world. He'll show them the profound power and glory of God. He'll show them the love of God. He'll show them what we're trying to preach to them because of the very experience of demonstration in front of them. Praise the Lord. There's something about it. I can see that God set the scene. 
There's a neighbor in your community that doesn't know the law. He doesn't care about God. And, and the Lord wants to convict that man's soul. This man be a, may be a very wicked man. And uh, you may find him causing you trouble. He doesn't seem to care how he mistreats your children. And he may not appreciate your dog coming over in his yard. He may not appreciate you uh, making friends with him. Or a number of things can happen to neighbors and men on the job you work with. But the Lord wants to show this man a Christian, a real Christian. So the Lord sets a little play up, a little act all set up, act number one. God allows you to be put in a position to display what God would like that man to know as a love of God. Praise the Lord. Be careful before you call the police on him. <laughs> be careful before you give him up and say, well, that man can never get saved. Because all we're to do is display what God wants done. Amen. There's something about it when God wants to win souls, he doesn't always consult us on the method he wants to use. And I think of Brother Larson going down to Columbia and hearing this man's testimony and hearing how that he went there and suffered for some seven years, lost his wife, had to preach her own funeral, bury her, and still there's no results, no converts, no re results seem like visibly, but there was something in that man that just stayed and stayed and stayed. I believe the devils of Columbia had a conference, and I believe they organized all their imps to set themselves in an array against for the loss and his wife and family coming to Columbia. I believe they set about doing whatever they could to hinder that work. And there was a man that was just as, just as determined to see that it goes. God called me here one year, two years, three years, four years, five years. By the time anybody go home five years, after all, if you can't do anything five years, you ought to quit. And I believe it was seven years. Losing his wife and all of these hardships, I think that the devils of hell had it all planned. This will just about get him. He'll be here so long. He'll get homesick. Things will be discouraging. It won't work out for him. He'll find reason to go home after about four or five years. He's bound to go home. But when he didn't go home, no doubt there might have been a, a plan and might have been a bargain. And they might have said, well, if you'll let us uh, take that man's wife away from him, I'll be sure he'll go home too. Whether the Lord had that kind of a bargain, I don't know. But there's a bargain about Job, something like that. And the Lord just allowed the angels that will go down and take it to Lost and bring it on home. The Lord seems to come with the devil to a certain point. The reason he does is to prove his point. Yeah. Praise the Lord! Yeah. To prove his point! Yeah. Brother, when this man could stand that test, preach his own wife's funeral, make her own coffin, I think it was, and uh, stand there and carry out this act, those people of Columbia saw a demonstration of the glory and the presence of God upon a missionary they never saw in all their life. Praise the Lord! There was something that happened to those folks. They began to come in to want to inquire, how could a man do this? I've never in all of my life saw anything like this. No, I guess you haven't. Because God's demonstrating his divine love for a lost and dying Columbia. Praise the Lord! There's me and the same without God over there. If I have to suffer one of mine being lost to this life, and don't think for a moment, friend, that when a Christian falls in battle, that that's defeat. No siree. Oh, bless your heart. We, we've gained victories when we've gone on to be with the Lord. It's God's program for you and for me. So we'll put God and then he takes one and leaves the other. It's none of our business. We just keep on going. Keep on believing God. Peter and James sat in that prison house, and they took James and beheaded him. Sad day for that church. A sad day for that wife. Sad day for that family. Sad day for all of his friends. But there sat the apostle Peter, untouched, unharmed. There's a great place right there for everybody to question God. Why did God do that and he let him go? Almost blaming God that he didn't know how to conduct his business. Well, God just said, well, it's time for Jane to go off stage. I'm through with his part of the act. And here's Simon. I'm still, he's on stage yet. That's all there is to it. That was the end of his part. End of his course. End of his race. Right. He's finished. For this act, praise the Lord. We look on the scene sometimes in a sympathetic human 
thinking until we think if we die, it's a terrible thing. If anything happens bad to us, like if we lose a loved one or a friend or a close one. But the Almighty God controls this church. This is His doing, not mine, not yours. And if it's His divine will to move one of us off the scene, that's His business. Friend, when he could have very well have kept both of them in jail. That same angel would come down and lock the door for Simon, could have unlocked the door for Jane just as well. Just as well. And Jane, Peter was sitting there asleep when the angel walked in. And the uh, the devil had it all set up. Just the very next day, Herod was going to carry out the plan. It's all signed, sealed, and settled. It's going to work. Uh, I know it's going to work. All of his little devils had it all plot and planned to get rid of this apostle, Apostle Peter. He's got the keys. But let me tell you something. There is something about it. The presence of God and the Spirit of the Holy Ghost is working whether you and I know it or not. We, are, we sometimes say God's working in a service and we've got a real glorious shout and hallelujah. That's fine. That's wonderful. But God is, is also working when we're going through a definite hard, terrible place. The Holy Ghost is still there. The devil comes along and whispers in your ear and says, oh, look, they took James out last night and beheaded him. You're next, Simon. I, I, I don't know what if I'd kind of throw up my hand and quit serving that Jesus. I don't know what I just forget about the whole thing. But evidently he didn't seem to care too much. He went to sleep. No one tomorrow is going to be hitting me. Might as well go, go out arrested, go out worrying about it. He sat in that prison, went to sleep. That's a Holy Ghost kind of peace. I, it couldn't have been any other kind. <laughs> That's a peace of God. <laughs> I can almost see the devils in hell trying to get up a little storm and say, well, do something to wake him up. After all, he's going to go to sleep on us in the middle of his act. It won't be much of a job to, uh, tomorrow. Let's keep him awake all night. Keep him worried all night. Brother, that devil can keep you on aspirins and anisons and on sleeping pills and get up pills and get down pills and everything else if he can keep you worried. Amen. Word, 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 word. His worried devils are on time. They've got plenty of jobs and plenty of people that's giving them plenty to do. But I, I somehow there was a peace that came into Simon's heart. And I think that devil was sent along there to keep him awake all night. He tried every act he could perform. He couldn't keep him awake because he wasn't tuned in on him. He was tuned in on heaven's peace. The Lord said, I'll give you my peace, Simon. The kind of peace that the world can't give nor can it take away. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Sitting there in the stop in an uncomfortable position. And yet, praise the Lord. Brother, that to me is a display of, uh, of real peace. Real peace. Amen. Praise the Lord. Real peace. And I can see that jitter walking past by the cell looking in. And there's the funniest thing I've ever seen. Those fellows that we put in that, in that uh, cell are going to go out to Marty Bent and shoot him. They walk the cell all night long. That's when they thought the preacher's still asleep in there. Brother, they're in heaven. heaven. Heaven angels looking on the scene. And I believe the Lord just packed a special angel. I want to go down and take care of Simon, get him out of jail. I'm not through with him yet. Just not part of that isn't the end of the act for him. I want him going out there and go out to that prayer meeting and go off someplace else and take care of himself and uh, still a job for him to do. Well, the angel didn't have to stop and ask the question how to do it. He just walked on through the uh, guards and passed the guards through the gate into the building. He didn't open the door. He went on in there. Got a hold of Simon and took him on the shoulder and woke him up. Wake up, Simon. And Simon checked himself and looked around and said, Simon, you're going to be doing what the guards say do. He got up, and Simon got up and put on his sandals and he all the way to the the house and began to walk kind of out in his didn't seem to have much concern about where I was going. I guess I'm supposed to go somewhere. Maybe I'm going to execution now. And it, this is going to be it, and that's about the size of it. But when that cold air hit him out in the, out in the courtyard, he woke up. And the angel got him outside the gate, and that thing clinked behind him. He said, now, you, you can take care of me on out. <laughs> so now I get you outside the gate, you ought to do the rest of it. And then looked around, he's gone. Well, sure, he had enough sense. And he knew there was a prayer meeting going on. He knew where it was going to be. He wasn't there, but he knew there was going to be one. Praise the Lord. There's going to be a prayer meeting. Brother, if the church would pray for our people when they get in prison, and pray and pray and pray and pray until the angels come on the scene and unlock their prison doors. No need of our church people going around discouraged, disgruntled, and disheartened, and defeated, and whipped, and beaten. Brother, let's get a, let's get a prayer meeting going. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 
The Lord wanted this world to know that no jail would hold his actors and he wanted to get them out. He'll take them out and he'll let them get in. He'll take them out. Well, that next morning must have been an awful commotion in that jailhouse when they went in there to find that sleeping preacher. And there he's gone. Yes, sir, brother. He disappeared in his dreams that night and they couldn't find him. I want you to see that, that the works of the evil forces are working against the church. Now, we're no different. They're in Act 1. We're in Act 3. They did their job well. They read their lines well. They carried out their performance well. In fact, it was so well that we have a whole book of acts of the early church, how they acted during their time on stage. Act after act. And the Lord said, I like that so well that their church... I want the rest of my church to do the same old way. Same way, same way, same way, same way. Same way, same way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Now there's the work the same today. Yeah. We may be here passing resolution and bylaw. But I want you to know something unless the resolution or bylaw is in accord to this book, the act of this book, it won't mean that much to it. Because the heavenly director has his hand on this thing above all of us. I believe that we should abide by. Yes. I believe we ought to abide by Amen. the obligations that we make upon one another. We ought to stand by. Amen. Praise the Lord. I believe Paul settled that circumcision question once and for all. They went up to Jerusalem and there was a quite a turmoil over that circumcision question. When those brothers got together and they settled that question, that was forever settled as far as Paul was concerned the apostles. It's forever done. Oh, I know some fellows over there, they kept on bringing it up, bringing it up, bringing it up. But Paul said, it's settled. It's settled. It's settled. It's settled. It's settled. It's settled. Praise the Lord. I'm getting a little bit tired of hearing folks of the rumors. Will television come up again? Will it come up again? As far as I'm concerned, it's settled. It's settled. Praise the Lord. Any honest, conscientious person that has signed those, those, that application is obligated under those obligations there. And then there's no, they settled what I talked about. It. There's no, those brothers settled that for me back there somewhere, back then somewhere, 10 years ago. Now, I don't think that happened by accident. I think the Almighty God had something to do with those brothers. I believe the Holy Ghost had something to do about it. I don't believe that God ever intended his church to be run on a political basis. I believe we ought to be so fearful about how we conduct our business meeting and conduct our vote that we're not counting votes and we're not counting pressure groups, but we're counting on God. Lord, you give me your mind. Praise the Lord. Give me the mind of the Holy Ghost. Because, brother, this isn't our play. This isn't our act. We're the actors. And actors do not choose their parts. No. The Holy Ghost chooses. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Holy Ghost chooses. Amen. I believe that we're living in the last days. I believe we're at the end of the, uh, of the, of the act is about to come. The curtain's about to come down. And oh, friend, it's such a cry in my soul. Oh, God, let act three equal act one. Praise the Lord. Let this last day church Compliment the first day church. Let this United Pentecostal church grasp the hold of the early church of spirituality, anointing, power, glory, unity, faith. May the Lord let all those things be a part of this church in this latter day. There's something about the Holy Spirit. God is moving. I know you can witness the same thing. There's a move of God on. If our ears is tuned toward heaven, the Spirit of living God is witnessing to all of us that the time of His coming draws by at hand. It's near at hand. Brother, you can look as Brother Chen just mentioned tonight. News as it is. I haven't read a newspaper in two or three days now. I feel pretty good. I haven't even heard a newscast, and I feel better. That dear old Gabriel here, I'm so glad he finally went off the air. He kept more people in the jitters than anybody I know. During World War II, he come on the air and said, well, we're losing on all fronts tonight. And by the time he got through, 
the saints had come to prayer meeting, come testify and gave the heater. <laughs> well, brother, if he's having a hard time back there, he ought to be here now and bet now. We have a time figuring that one out. But we're living in a day when everything about us is getting confused. And I, I believe that that's our audience is getting confused. You and I might forget figuring it out. We aren't going to make Johnson do any different than he's doing. And Mike McNamara, he's going to keep on uh, either taking those planes out of the air, putting them in. And I doubt very much if you're going to do much with those butchers, and I doubt if you're going to do very much with those leftists and rightists. And about the sanest way that I know of is to make sure that that crowd doesn't baffle you what you're doing your act on stage. It's the devil's job to confuse God's church that's on display. And if you're not careful, you'll let that crowd baffle you and, and get you so confused that you'll lose your lines and you'll turn on the audience and you'll start ripping them apart. That's all the devil wants. He heckled you and you heckled back. He heckled again, you heckled back again. And while you're heckling, you lost sight of your lines and your part in God's program. And he finally had my, some folks, he's had to say, uh, would you please get that one off stage? He doesn't know his part. Right. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And when you lose your part and lose your line, he doesn't display you, you just mark it down. <laughs> but in the confusion of our time that we live in, it's only fulfilling what Brother Erickson, Brother Perry preached 40 years ago. But we're living in it. The condition of our world that's in the moral condition of our nation, our Supreme Court has disappointed everybody that I know of. They are, there are so many letdowns, letdowns, letdowns. Now what does that mean? It means that this church should know where it's going, what it's going to do about it, and keep its head, keep its heart, and walk clean and holy, because we're getting ready to get out of here. God intended for this church to be politicians. And now you may run for councilman, you may run for mayor, you may run for some political job, but I'll guarantee you, you'll lose out spiritually and you won't correct anything. The best job you can run for is a Holy Ghost filled, powerful, packed Holy Ghost ministry. Fill the power and the glory of God. And if we're out to run for God, We've got to climb that spiritual ladder. We've got to keep our souls guarded from the darkness of this world. We must keep the light when the world is losing its, its direction. We must not curse the darkness, but strike a light. And I believe this time that we in the church realize it's the devil's business to divide us. The devil's business to confuse us. Brother, we've got to be determined. We're going to love each other. We're going to find an answer. We're going to pray that God give us an answer. We're going to love our brother above ourselves. We're going to surrender our will to the will of God. We're going to pray for heaven set revival and the Holy Ghost working that will solve all of our needs. That's the only answer I can see for this day we live in. Mordecai said, Esther, if you don't think that you, because you're in the king's chamber, that you'll escape the decree. And when, Mar when Hester saw that she was involved, oh, I'm safe for the whole ghost out in the victory. I'm going to heaven. Glory, hallelujah. But wait a minute. That devil's got something for you, too. You won't escape it either. And Esther said this. Said, you tell them to go out and fast three days and three nights. I'm going to fast with my maiden three days and three nights. I'll go in before the king. If I die, I die. Yeah. Brother, this church never progressed until blood was shed. And we're doing all we can to keep from shedding any. This, this, when the church bleeds, it blesses. It's for sure. And I, I'll grant you, I'm not talking about modern conveniences. That doesn't make the difference. I tell you what does make the difference. is the condition of our hearts in giving ourselves. You can be as poor as Job's turkey and never have a dime to spare and still be a gullible, covetous person. 
But I believe that when the church has felt this burden for the call of the hour, and we can say, as I see Brother Beasley has done in going to this uh, foreign land, if I die, I die. But I go to give myself at least what I can give. I, I, I want to put this in our own land. I, I, I pray God will give us more missionaries. And I hope somebody will speak more about missionaries before it's over. But I want to say to you and me tonight, I feel like we must make a missionary consecration. We must make it in America. Right in this country, make that kind of a consecration. The kind of a consecration that can say, if I die, if I perish, I perish. I tell you, many a man of God is suffering tonight under the terrible little uh, onslaught of being a failure. Oh, if I lose this bit of my church, I'll be a failure. My brother will think I'll fail it. I'm not a very good preacher. I can't hold folks together. Friend, until you get a church and a foundation of holiness, righteousness, respect for the pastor, church government, living holy lives, it won't stick. It won't stick. But if you got a foundation, it's got two, three, four, five, ten, whatever it is. You've got a church that's built on a rock. The winds will blow, the waves will come. But there's something in that church that says, we're sticking, we're sticking. Hallelujah, we're staying, we're staying, we're staying, we're staying. We're here to stay. Bless your heart, the devil will get tired of blowing his old hot air for a while. He'll forget about you. Well, I can't do any good there. Go someplace else. And while he's let up on you, grab a few more and bring them in. Get them grounded. Praise the Lord. Every church has a time, it seems like, when the devil gets in and starts kicking off the walls. And you wonder who's going to stand now. That's right. Who's going to make it now? I tell you who's going to make it. Those that dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's stand together. symbols symbolic objects the rainbow a symbol of God's covenant a stairway a symbol of the way to God thunder lightning clouds and smoke symbols of God's majesty thunder a symbol of God's voice Trumpets, a symbol of God speaking. The pillar of cloud and fire, a symbol of guidance. A throne, a symbol of God's glory. Dry bones, a symbol of spiritual death. White hair, a symbol of wisdom. The wind, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Fire, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Stars and lampstands, symbols of God's ministers. A signet ring, a symbol of authority. Arrows, symbols of God's judgments. A scepter, a symbol of God's rule. The capstone, a symbol of preeminence. A rock, a symbol of stability. The human body, a symbol of interdependence. Grass, a symbol of human frailty. Symbolic creatures, the serpent, a symbol of Satan's subtlety. Locus, a symbol of God's judgment. 
beasts, symbols of earthly kingdoms. A dove, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. A lamb, a symbol of Jesus Christ's sacrifice. Symbolic actions, breaking a jar, a symbol of the destruction of Jerusalem. The cursing of a fig tree, a symbol of judgment. Washing hands, a symbol of innocence. Being thirsty, a symbol of spiritual need. Baptism, used for salvation, a symbol of cleansing. The Lord's Supper, a symbol of union with Christ. Anointing, a symbol of empowering by God's Spirit. Harvesting, a symbol of judgment day. Tearing garments, a symbol of anger and sorrow. Spitting, a symbol of contempt. Shaking off dust, a symbol of rejection. Sitting in sackcloth and ashes, a symbol of repentance. Lifting of hands, a symbol of prayer. Covering the head, a symbol of submission. Symbols expressing God's nature and character, God's face, a symbol of his presence. God's arm or hand, a symbol of his power. God's eye, a symbol of his awareness. God's ear, a symbol of God's listening. God bless you. Thanks for watching.